Would you please speak to the differences between OCPD and OCD? Absolutely. And this is probably could be a talk in and of itself. So one of the things that I'm really looking for with OCPD is I'm looking for a pervasive pattern that exists across interactions, including social interactions, interpersonal interactions. I'm not typically seeing a specific stimulus. The other thing that's important is remember compulsions are going to be a key criterion for OCD, which we may not necessarily see to the same extent or to the same magnitude in OCPD. Next question. Any experience with riluzol for refractory OCD? Unfortunately, I don't have any experience here. Uh, there are several open label. There is one double wine placebo controlled trial that I'm aware of that does suggest some benefit. Um, the times where I've uh, wanted to try it, unfortunately, I've, I've not been able to do so from an insurance standpoint. How would you distinguish between OCD and illness anxiety disorder? Excellent question and really, really difficult to distinguish here. So one of the things for me in terms of separating these is again, looking at time course. So typically for OCD, I'm looking at when the disorder emerged and I'm looking for something to have emerged earlier on. I'm also looking at those comorbidity patterns that we talked about. Um, and I'm really looking at, at the general phenomenology of the two disorders. Again, this is where we can go back to that Sesame Street song and think about which one of these is not like the other. We know that they have very distinct risk factors and that they have different courses. Next question. Do you use or recommend pharmacogenetic testing in patients with OCD and many suboptimal SSRI trials? I think the person asking this question is trying to trick me. Because for some reason, they included the word suboptimal SSRI trials. Let's try to unpack that. So in terms of we can certainly have a patient who's treated with a very, very low dose of fluoxetine and has no 2D6, they can have side effects with a quote-unquote suboptimal trial. This is where sometimes just thinking about dose in and of itself is problematic. I would say, actually, I'm going to change the question because I can. So if we were looking at a patient that had had optimized trials, so they'd not responded to 200 milligrams of sertraline or 150 milligrams of sertraline, they've not responded to 60 milligrams of fluoxetine or even 40 milligrams of fluoxetine, I would actually get pharmacogenetic testing here. The other thing is that even in the absence of pharmacogenetic testing, we can use clinical pharmacology to guide what we're doing. For example, that patient that I mentioned who had no response at 200 milligrams of sertraline, and let's say he or she didn't have side effects at 200 milligrams of sertraline, and I'm trying to consider my next SSRI, I am not going to pick escitalopram or citalopram as my next SSRI. Why? Well, they're both metabolized primarily by 2C19, which is the primary enzyme metabolizing sertraline. So I'm probably going to pick something that's metabolized through a different pathway. So again, even in the absence of having the pharmacogenetic testing, knowing about pharmacogenetics can help us make informed decisions. Next question. Thoughts on daily use of benzos considering risk of addiction and cognitive effects? So I, I love this question. This is, this is when you're up on stage and somebody says, you know, do you use benzodiazepines, Dr. Strawn? And you kind of look around like that, well, maybe sometimes. So I do use them in my clinical practice. Um, I tend to use them over a shorter time course. I tend to use less lipophilic and low dose benzodiazepines, translated to generally clonazepam for me. In terms of the cognitive effects and the addiction effects, I want to spend a couple of moments talking about that. And I am not downplaying the risk of substance use disorder or benzodiazepine use disorder. I want to make that clear. But when we look at the long-term data in anxiety disorders for benzodiazepines, they do not suggest an increase in dose over time, and they do not suggest generally problematic behavior. These come from three large epidemiologic studies. In terms of the cognitive effects, the literature is quite mixed. 
And one of the things that we know is a very, very significant risk factor for major neurocognitive disorder is anxiety. So in the studies that have actually controlled for anxiety, we have not seen this risk of cognitive impairment. In fact, and I want to be careful with this, in one of the studies, there's actually suggestion that the benzodiazepine may have, been effect, it may have uh, decreased the risk of major neurocognitive disorder. Now, again, I am not saying that we should give benzodiazepines to decrease the risk of major neurocognitive disorder. What I think is probably happening in that study is that there's another relationship. We have decreased anxiety, which we know is a risk factor. I think this is the same reason why when we look at the SSRI studies in older patients, we see a, if you will, protective effect. All right, we have one minute and 45 seconds. Let's move on to another question. When do we start with a benzo and when do we start with an SSRI? I tend to start almost universally with an SSRI. When I am treating OCD as well as social anxiety disorder, I tend to use half of my starting dose as a rule of thumb that I would typically use in depression. Um, I will generally add on a benzodiazepine primarily in social anxiety disorder in situations where I'm really not seeing rapid improvement or I'm not seeing any significant early improvement over that first four to six weeks. I will also use it in a patient who is optimally treated with an SSRI who has partial response to that SSRI. And again, I am not using high potency, highly lipophilic, high dose benzodiazepines. I am using very low doses of low lipophilicity, low potency benzodiazepines. One more question. Next question here. I treat lots of people who have never caught up after staying at home for two years of COVID. Kids who never return to school, mom who remains uber anxious, 20 year olds without jobs. How do I reverse the effects of COVID lockdown? I think this is something that we are all really struggling with. And, and I wish I had more than 25 seconds here left. I will do my best though. I think this is where we can go back to the very small exposures. And these are things that we can even formulate in the context of a med check. Again, we are not going to reverse the effects of two years or two and a half years of COVID in eight weeks or in a single med check. But we can ship away at those effects. And I think that the way to do that is through exposures, through very careful exposures, but multiple exposures. I will typically start those exposures in my very first initial evaluation appointment. 